Welcome back uh, to all viewers. Welcome back to the last session of today. We're going to talk about um, impact investment and inclusion. Um, what part do the impact investors play in the current discussions um, uh, about fund right, about Black Lives Matter, about, um, well, basically any uh, social issue we're facing in these times. Um, what are their responsibilities and what are their dilemmas? I'm gonna speak with three guests, one of which is sitting next to me, and two are online, on screen. Can we see them? Yeah, hi. I'm gonna quickly introduce the, the, the two um, guests that are not here. Uh, first of all, that's Kanini Mutoni. She is Managing Director at Draper Richard Kaplan Foundation. Uh, Kanini, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Sandra. Second. She heard you. Oh, she heard me. A second. I thought a second. <laughs> you second. Yeah, yeah, okay. Hi, yeah. Well, welcome, Kanini. Hi, there's a bit of an echo, but I will just have to manage it. Yeah, okay. Is it, uh, is it, am I speaking too loud? No, I think it's just an echo. It's just an echo. Speak. Yeah, but don't worry about it. We'll, we'll manage it. Yeah, are you in the, in the Hague? No, I'm in London. You're in London. Yes. Uh, t tell me, what, what is the Draper Richard Kaplan Foundation and what are you doing there? Sure. So uh, DRK or Draper Richards Kaplan is a venture philanthropy firm. And what that means is that we deploy capital on, on two sides of the uh, capital spectrum. So we do um, philanthropy and grants, and we also deploy mission aligned capital um, to early stage social enterprises that are aiming to solve complex problems in the world. Generally, we'd be the first institutional investors to come into um, the companies that we invest in. And we are sector agnostic and we are global. So we invest in the US, in Europe and in Africa. And you are opening today uh, in The Hague. Exactly. It's a very exciting day for us. We've had lots of investments in Europe, but we have formally opened an office um, in The Hague today. So big day for us. Uh, thank you. Thank you for now. Uh, we'll come back to you later. Uh, let me first introduce the second guest, uh, guest uh, that is Idris Noor, um, Executive Director at Doen Participaties. Uh, Idris, uh, can you tell me a bit more about what your job is at Doen? Yeah, what my job is? Yeah. Well, my job is, yeah, yeah. Well, actually, um, I'm privileged to... Uh, uh, be one of the two directors of Dune Foundation, which is the fund uh, re, um, which was established by the Dutch charity lotteries. And thanks to all the participants of the lotteries since 30 years, we can make uh, the world a better place, let's say. And where needed, uh, we do it with subsidies, but since 25 years, we already uh, used investments. So uh, we have quite uh, a big portfolio in green, social, and creative investments. Uh, and so I have a wonderful job, as you can imagine. <laughs> yeah, and, and your job is being the boss of all of that. Well, <laughs> I have a very, um, a very active uh, team, so I try. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> You're coping, yeah. Um, uh, and then uh, to my third guest, Marianne Spier, uh, sitting next to me. You are the founder of FEM Start, F-A-M, of F-E-M Start. What is that? Well, FemStart is an accelerated program for female entrepreneurs, uh, women in tech, and especially focused in Europe and in Africa. And uh, it, it was... Uh, apparently necessary to start such a fund? Yes, well, it is um, it's mostly focused on accelerating the business. We have been doing this for five years already, and what we've seen is um, by training and uh, making these uh, female entrepreneurs investment ready, we had a track record of 100%. Women were able to raise between 250,000 and 1 million euro. So... What we discovered, we were doing this via competitions and mentoring programs, and then we said we need to create a program for this so that we can even scale our own program and help these women raise more money. 
yeah. for their companies. And, and how is that going so far? It is going really well, but uh, we see that now with COVID, uh, a lot of female entrepreneurs are hit with, you know, especially financial difficulties. And also more, more than men? Yes, because, and the data is there, so, um, and because also they raise less money. Yeah. Today, even, uh, it's published in the Dutch newspaper that less than 1% of female entrepreneurs received funding in the Netherlands. This is just the Netherlands, mm -hmm. which means, what are we saying, that 99% of these women are not able to raise mm -hmm. funds. Yeah. So I, I don't think that is the problem. But we discovered is that we need to train female entrepreneurs to become investment ready. Yeah. Uh, and that is due to lack of access to networks and lack of access to funding. So uh, female entrepreneurs are during these COVID times more vulnerable than male entrepreneurs. Yes, so they the have data. They less money on the bank. They have less money on the bank. They, yeah. they raise less funds. Yeah. So, yes, they're hit harder. Yeah. Um, we're going to talk about inclusion. Um, let me begin with uh, Canini. Um, uh, in, in what way are you at, um, at Draper Richard Kaplan Foundation promoting inclusion? How, how are you trying to uh, work on that? Sandra, before I go that, I'd like to just um, emphasize on a point that you just raised um, with, with Femstart around the impact of COVID on female entrepreneurs. Yeah. I mean, over and above the fact that women have raised less money during COVID, we are largely the ones who have been carrying this burden of homeschooling, working. Uh, managing the family and basically holding it all together. Yeah. So I have seen lots and lots of evidence and data showing that we have ultimately carried a much heavier burden um, than men have. And in fact, one report stated that we've gone back 10 years, 10 years in terms of gender equity because of COVID. So I think it's just something for all of us to think about that it's beyond the money that's been raised the social factors that have affected women during this period of time. Yeah, yeah, which, which is horrible news because, as we all know, um, uh, emancipation or more equality is also important in, for example, the fight against climate change. Absolutely, absolutely. So it's taking us back not just on gender equity but on everything else yeah. that hangs on to the peace. Yeah. Um, but let me jump to inclusion. So at DRK, and I'll also just wear my impact investor hat because I personally invest myself in, um, in enterprises with my own capital. And, you know, I think as an impact investor, you have to think about three things when you're trying to invest for inclusion. The first thing is, what problem are you solving? Okay. And I've seen lots of impact investors throw money at a symptom but not at the problem, okay? And for me, that means that we're wasting capital, we're misallocating it, and ultimately we're just setting a bad example for the rest of the financial ecosystem. So, so that's the first question we ask ourselves at DRK and for me personally. If it's racial inequity, do we just throw money into a fund and say, hey, let's fund more black entrepreneurs? No, we ask ourselves, why are there fewer black entrepreneurs? Why are there fewer female entrepreneurs? Why are they not raising capital? And then find that root cause and then fund it. And it could be, maybe there's a lack of networks like was just mentioned earlier. Maybe the education system isn't right. So we need to fund the, um, you know, the local education systems to, to have more entrepreneurs coming through. Or maybe it's just an access issue. But you know, I think we have to focus on the right issue and on the right problem. Um, and unfortunately, we've seen too many examples of symptoms being funded, but not problems being funded. Can, can you name um, an example yeah. of, of such a uh, uh, yeah, symptom being funded instead of a problem, which is on the, on the roots of it? Sure. And, and I'll name names. You know, right now with the Black Lives Movement, we've seen lots of, you know, philanthropic and commercial capital being raised. Um, SoftBank came up with $80 million three weeks ago and said they're only going to fund Black entrepreneurs. And I think that's noble. But at the back of my mind, I'm thinking, but you're not solving the issue. The issue is True, they're not raising enough capital, but the issue is that they're not even getting to the point where they have a business model, where they've even been able to set up a company. 
why don't you start there? Start there and fund that rather than throwing $80 million into a fund, imagining that you're going to capture and solve the problem. So I think there's been too many examples of that lately, um, and, and we need to call it out if we're going to make a change. Yeah. If you, if you look at the underlying problems which cause uh, these differences in outcome, uh, you see the things are getting worse. I mean, uh, wealth inequality is is growing. Uh, segregation, um, you know, the the, the 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 affordability of good education. Um, so, uh, yeah, where to start, really? Yeah, and sometimes, and I'm sure Idris will agree, sometimes the problems are so complex. You know, and when you think about Black Lives Movement, this is 200 years of problems. I mean, we can't solve a 200-year-old problem by throwing $80 million at it. So it's, as you say, it's about um, making a decision as an investor, where are my values? If my values are around education, health, let me understand that context. Let me break down the problem into its component parts and then make a decision about the root causes that I am going to fund. It's possible, but I think we just need to think things through a little bit more than we're currently doing. Yeah. Uh, Iris, um, on to you. Um, do you really feel it's, it's an investor's job um, because, as, as uh, Kanini uh, stated, these problems are so big and so complex that you more or less automatically look to governments to fix these issues. Uh, do you really think, uh, first of all, it's, it's an investor's job uh, to, to, um, to think about these things? And secondly, do you think they, they can have an impact? Let me first say that uh, I agree with uh, Kanini that it is very, very complex. But there's also a danger that we keep telling each other that it's very complex and we look to the more systematic uh, uh, players, uh, meaning the education system whatsoever, and nothing will change because these changes take a long time. So I think uh, for us as an investor, having in the name to do, uh, do means to act, uh, I think, of course, it is also, uh, it's actually the responsibility of everyone um, in any system. So if you would call a society or an economic system a system, then the investors have as much as a role as uh, schools that have role models showing that girls can also end up in tech, whatever. So for us as investors, I think we have a role, but we should not uh, uh, also overestimate what our influence can be. I think um, for us, uh, it's very important to start uh, at ourselves, uh, meaning that how do we search for uh, uh, potential investees, potential entrepreneurs? How have we learned to look and how do we have to relearn to look differently maybe? Because we also have blind spots, even though we have, of course, beautiful enterprises we supported, we know we still are, uh, are in a bubble. Even ourselves, we try to be really connected to relevant ecosystems, but we, I think we have to start ourselves to be very honest that you have to try to, uh, to look differently uh, and then also to take the steps that are necessary to, uh, to make changes in the way how you invest it. Meaning that, um, as we all know, uh, even the impact investing world, but the, 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 uh, the more conservative uh, investing world, uh, follows certain rules and follow and, and when it comes to contracting, whatever. You see um, that inclusion and looking into how you uh, find uh, entrepreneurs, uh, how you enable them to uh, become investable, um, all these are things uh, investors have uh, a very important role, yeah, I think. Can you name a, a dilemma, uh, a very practical dilemma uh, you're facing when it comes to inclusion in your daily job? I think a, a big di dilemma is that um, if you don't make alliances with other investors, uh, you cannot be a real change maker when it comes to inclusion. So very practical. If we would put in a contract 
let's say, uh, because we support mainly startups, when it comes to supervisory boards, that's usually a later stage. But imagine we would put in a contract uh, that inclusiveness, whatever that means, would be very important to us, selection of their supervisory board and so on. If you don't have an alliance of other investors that would say, hey, this, met this does matter, we should agree on that, you, that's, that's a dilemma because you will, for the entrepreneur, you will be the only one talking about that. Yeah. Mm. Sandra, can I just quickly comment, please? Of course you can. Yeah, so, so I mean, Idris raised a, a really interesting point around being in a bubble. And, and I wanted to reflect a little bit on that in the sense that even before we start talking about how we're going to source great entrepreneurs, how we're going to find more women, within our own organizations, we need to be diverse because I think it's completely hypocritical for us to imagine that we're going to go out there and have you know, great equity and inclusion in our investments, but in our own deal teams, in our own investment committees, in our own boards, be a white, male, heterosexual, and without any form of diversity. Yeah. I think it's, to be honest, it's, it's, it's quite hypocritical. So one thing that we do um, at DRK is we ensure that we, we have a diverse team that are looking and sourcing for deals. And then when we, um, we also take a seat at the board, we also ensure that the boards that we're joining are also diverse. So it's, it's putting a lens on everything. It's not just in the searching and in the investing process, it's across the entire uh, value chain of work that you're doing as an investor that that matters. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Marianne, um, we're speaking about diversity. Um, uh, isn't it a bit contradictionary to fund just women? No, with your fund. No, I don't think so. Because what we're doing is trying to stimulate the pipeline to make it more diverse. Mm. And um, because uh, we hear a lot of discussions uh, uh, from uh, VCs and, and investors, impact investors, that they cannot find the women, or it was very difficult to uh, for them uh, to pitch towards the, the investors. So I think while stimulating you, the pipeline, you create more di a diverse pipeline for investors to in be able to be invest in uh, female entrepreneurs. Yeah, so you, you don't see... A um, yeah, you don't see a form of segregation or treating people differently. You see, that you don't see that as a problem. You see that as a stimulus. Well, I don't see it as segregation. No, yeah, uh, but yeah, but yeah. I, I see it as uh, uh, making female entrepreneurs investment ready, yeah. so that they're able to pitch their companies towards um, other investors and so that they are able to raise funds. Yeah. What we've seen is uh, the last five years that the women we have trained and who were able to raise funds, once they received the training and, and followed the program, they were able to go into the world and be in a diverse environment and even be able to be on the same level with other male entrepreneurs. Yeah. Yeah. Well, sounds sounds reasonable. It's a good answer. Yeah, it's a good answer. <laughs> yeah, no, but it's hard. I mean, as a as a as a man, it's hard to to think about these issues because you're not confronted with them. You yes, know, yes, really. and I, I I was not confronted by it too. So I, in my mindset, was even that privileged because I was yeah. thinking I have no issues with that. But yeah. there is a large group. If you look at the 99%, yeah. if you're saying that there are 30% uh, female entrepreneurs. In the Netherlands, that are, are, are entrepreneurs, or they have a, a number. Let's yeah. say that uh, not all of them are have startups. Yeah. So if they're there and they are not able to raise funds, there is a problem. Yeah. And um, I'm trying to help fix that. Yeah. <laughs> because of course we all have this prejudice about the business world, um, and even the more abstract thing of competition being inherently uh, male, masculine. Um, uh, is that so? To start it, with, I mean, is that is that is that typish, the typical uh, masculine thing? Competition? I don't know. Um, I, I sit in investment committees and I see the difference. The way uh, 
investors look at female entrepreneur once they pitch. Yeah. So if they're when they're not very focal, they're too shy and they don't know if they're going to invest in them. Mm. And if they're very focal, they're aggressive and they don't know if they're going to invest in them. So these discussions are there. It's never, they're never doing it the is, right thing. Yes. Yeah. So I think that um, is it a masculine world? Yes, it is a masculine world. If you look at what is happening, if you look at the investors that are there, uh, you yeah. But see is, that is it is it a masculine world because doing business is a masculine thing to do, or is it a masculine uh, world because you just have a lot of men in that world? I think the system is masculine. The yeah. system of the the way it is built, the capitalism system, is yeah. masculine because yeah. it's built by men. So it's not organized for for it was not organized for women to no. be in that system so no. what you had before oops sorry what you had before is that you had to act like a man to be there and be visible and to to interact and to be able to 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 become to be an entrepreneur yeah. but nowadays not everybody wants to act like men to raise funds and that is why it is important that not just the entrepreneurs but also the investors are female or are from a different um, ethnicity yeah uh canini is, is that also something you believe in that um mm -hmm. yeah we need a, a structural change of the whole economic system to become less uh masculine yeah <laughs> I mean, I think it's a very interesting discussion. I, I, I differ it's a tough in the one, sense I need to that say as a man. <laughs> it is, and you know, I feel for you. You're in yeah. a minority seat oh, yeah. right now, white, yeah. white and male, and and probably privileged. Um, totally no, I, privileged, I think, yeah. <laughs> I think what what I do agree with in terms of what's just been said is we need more women who are making the investment decisions, and and I'm so glad to hear that. Um, Femstad, uh, the founder of Femstad, is sitting on investment committees. I mean, that is something I have committed myself to doing, sitting on impact fund investment committees, being on boards that are likely, most cases, majority male and white, and sort of bringing a different voice to the table and being able to identify men and women entrepreneurs who I think could change the world. So, so I think that's probably the answer, having people at the table who are able to see things differently and not have everyone with the same sort of mindset, with the same sort of background, with the same sort of gender, because quite likely they will not make the right decisions. I mean, that's the point of diversity. Yeah. Different people around the table bring different ideas that are much richer and much more um, sustainable. But can you can you draw some sort of vision how uh, a business world with more female values would look like? Well, it doesn't even have to be a business world. Look at your current political climate. Look at the countries that manage the COVID crisis the best. They were all led by women. Yeah, Zealand, a, a couple of Germany, faraway islands. Well, New Zealand, <laughs> Germany. Germany is right next to you. Yeah, be careful. You're right. um, I mean, it, it's a, such a stark contrast with how, you know, the countries led by men managed it, you know, all the way from Latin America, Bolsonaro, Boris Johnson, Donald Trump. I mean, it's quite clear that the way we see risk, the way we manage risk and the way we execute and the way we lead is different. And we tend to do it better in a crisis. Yeah, I think you're right. <laughs> uh, yeah. um, uh, Idris, um, onto you. Um, what you see happening uh, lately is that all kinds of uh, social issues are being tied together. So you see uh, Greta Thunberg uh, speak about Black Lives Matter when she, you know, uh, initially just went on the streets because of her worries about climate change. Um, do you think it's smart to mix all those things up uh, um, if, if, if we talk about uh, the support for these different uh, issues. I think the problem, uh, Sander, is that we see we treat them as different issues. Yeah. While uh, they are interconnected somehow. Uh, um, you know, uh, of course, when it comes to to climate change, um, uh, let let me put it like this: the problem always was with social movements that. Uh, they were maybe not enough 
uh, connected to make uh, a real change. And when you look into history and you see that the moment uh, that uh, these different topics gathered, then they could really uh, make a bigger change. I think that um, uh, gender equality or uh, climate change, this is all, uh, or let's call it more climate crisis, this is all somehow interconnected uh, in, in terms of what do we put in the opposite of something we would call a crisis. So what kind of uh, uh, um, positive or let's say a bit also utopian views do we have that would replace the existing systems that uh, uh, obviously um, accelerate crisis after crisis after, after crisis because we talk about the climate, but the result of it is also a lot of people that are forced to leave. We call them, uh, you know, refugees. Uh, what's the position of uh, the providers in these communities? Very often it's the women that provide, but uh, male have uh, the power. So, you know, it's difficult not to, to see them uh, uh, in a connected way. Yeah, no, of course. I mean, we're all here progressive and forward thinking, uh, but unfortunately not, not everybody is. And I can imagine uh, when you start packaging all these issues in one package, uh, you will lose a lot of people. You see that happening. I mean, I, I think in, in, for example, in Holland, uh, you might find a majority uh, for, you know, reasonable, sensible uh, climate policies. But when you connect that to all kinds of other issues, left-wing dogmas or however you want to call them, uh, you start losing support. Should, should, shouldn't, uh, uh, sh shouldn't you guys as well, maybe myself as well, just pick our battles a bit more and not package, make package deals? Um, let me, before we go to the other participants, just shortly answer. I think that's exactly what's going wrong, that we label these ideas as let's say progressive, whatever. Uh, I think that everyone is feeling that there is uh, uh, a crisis going on. Uh, uh, then you would have rather uh, differences between urban areas and not urban areas. And you would have, uh, you know, I think it's, it's all affecting uh, a, a lot of people. So I hear what you are saying that, if you interconnect it and you make it so complex, you would maybe lose people that, that I, I put it bluntly, they love trees, but what would they have to do with, uh, let's say, uh, you know, the gender issue? I, hear, um, I understand what you, what you say. What I'm saying is that it's, it's not so much um, that, you would put, that you would fight for all the subjects and you would communicate uh, at the same time about them, but you have to understand that they are all interconnected. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Mm. Um, Sandra, can I quickly just comment with a with yeah, a piece of, course, of, of, of of data? So, so I think great question, and you know I think Idris's point is that okay, they are all interconnected, but I think the best way to communicate is to help people understand things in a language that they understand. So you know I'm, I'm a person who values evidence around around everything, above everything. And Kellogg Foundation um, last year, before the Black Lives Movement, did a report for the US market to understand what is the cost to the US economy of inequality in race, social justice, employment, labor, and entrepreneurship. So they did the package that you're talking about, but they were extrapolating it to the impact on the economy. And they came up with an excellent report and an excellent um, analysis where they found that $8 trillion of the US economy, there would be an increase in the size of the US economy by $8 trillion by 2050 if those inequalities were removed and solved. And then they extrapolated that even further to GDP and they found that if those issues were resolved, GDP would go up by 0.5% per year for the US economy. Yeah. Now, for me, if, if, you, if you sat down and you provided this cleanly analyzed data from an economic standpoint and packaged everything, it becomes much easier to understand because you can see the impact of what inequality and inclusion has 
on the overall economy. Yeah. Yeah, you, you would hope for people to be open for facts, uh, but of course that's also a problem nowadays, huh? We have to try, Sander. You yeah, know? Yeah, okay, we, okay. We, we have to We're try to be up. different no. as much as you're right you know, facts and, and, you know, fake news is, is common, but we have to keep trying. Yeah. At least let's have a basis for, for, for what we're saying. Yeah. Um, Marianne, um, do, do you meet, uh, do you encounter a lot of cynicism from male entrepreneurs who are like, what are you doing? Why is this ne necessary? Uh, I mean, being an entrepreneur is, you know, is for self-made people. You don't need help. You don't need to treat women differently from men. Well, five years ago I did, because at that time it was not um, politically correct to talk about it. But nowadays what I've seen is that the ones that are investing are mostly men. Not Dutch men, but they're men who... Not are, Dutch men, no? Not, no. But we're, we're the ones I encounter, you're talking about the ones that I encounter. Okay, yeah. Um, so, yeah, um, I, don't, uh, I don't see it for in my bubble, I yeah. must say, because I also am uh, somebody who will try to convince you to believe in this cause. Yeah. And if you see, if they, when they see the results, when they see the data, when they see that these women are raising money for their companies and that they're even during this crisis, they're able to make it because that's what most men love is data that you have to show them that it's working. Then that you have a completely different conversation. So yeah. my conversation mostly with these men I encounter is about data. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and, Sorry, Sandra. And, 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 and women, women don't like data. I don't know. That is, that is, <laughs> that is, well, not, that is not true. That is not true. Because I love data. I love data. So that yeah. is not the truth. But if you, you ask me about the, the yeah. men I encounter, so and especially the investors yeah. uh, I encounter and the ones that I need to convince that, it, that they should invest in female entrepreneurs. Yeah. Yeah. But I also think um, on, from the other side, it is also, and that is what we are training these uh, female entrepreneurs, is that they need to show the data also. Yeah. They're doing a lot of great work, but they're just working and not focused in showing what they're doing, which is not, which is a real male thing to do. Yeah. We're talking about male, female. <laughs> you started a company. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's my, my, my job, apparently. Yes, yeah. yes. And um, once they show the data and once they show the results, and, and then it's for them much easier to raise yeah. funds for their company. Yeah. Um, when we're speaking uh, about uh, instruments to change, to make, to make a change, uh, do you also believe in a, in a quota uh, on a government level when it comes to uh, f f female positions in higher... Uh, yes, position. I believe in quotum yeah. because uh, I, I've been asked this question, I think, ev by every journalist if I believe in quotum, and I always say yes. Why? Because the women that are being chosen are most, most of the time very excellent at what they do. So f um, what I was saying in the beginning is that most there is a lack of access to these boardrooms or yeah. to these spaces, especially spaces for investment. So if a codem is needed to to stimulate yeah. that, then I believe in that. Yes. Yeah, we we need to use a bit of force. Yes, we do. Yeah, um, Canini, <laughs> uh, um, you um, you started uh, talking about the the setback COVID means in many ways. Um, uh, do you think it's only bad news, COVID, when it comes to inclusion? Wow. Um Again, I'll go back to the data because that's that's how I see things. The data is showing that inequality has increased and, and putting aside gender from a wealth standpoint, um, I think you probably also that, you know, Jeff Bezos's um, net wealth went up $75 billion over the last um, five months. But at the same time, if you just even look at the UK alone, we've had unemployment likely to be at 8% um, in the next couple of quarters. Um, we have lots of people who are, um, you know, don't have jobs. We're seeing an increased level of homelessness, even in developed economies like the UK. So sadly, 
I think COVID has benefited some, but it has been a huge, huge disadvantage to the majority. Yeah. But I think I'll add that what COVID did is that it just, it simply threw out inequalities that were there already, but they were made, it, were, it was made worse. It was exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, so this whole difference between those who have and those who do not have was simply expanded during the COVID, um, during the COVID pandemic. It was there, but it was just made much more, um, you know, clear and, 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 and focused. How, how important are the American elections coming up? I mean, I can imagine that if, if Trump wins again, that everybody will be uh, pretty depressed about all of these de developments. I mean, inclusion is, uh, is having, again, a setback then. I think, Sandy, I mean, I, I don't like to do politics too much, but what, what I'll say is that we're lacking a moral, a, a, a moral leadership in the world right now. Yeah. From where I'm sitting, we just don't have moral leadership that we can all look up to and, and follow a clear example and and really feel inspired um, and feel that, you know, that, you know, our leaders really know what they're doing. So there's definitely a crisis of leadership. So I'm not here to say Biden or Trump is better or Boris or Key Keir Starmer is better. I just think we need a new generation of leadership. Yeah. And whether that's you, that's me, that's it just, it, it, we, we just, we, we do need to work on that, yeah. um, irrespective of who wins the election. No, but I asked the question because the big question is, of course, who follows? Huh? Is, it, is it the business world that follows politics or the other way around? Because I also don't see a lot of leadership in the business world. I mean, you're just referring to Jeff Bezos and his generation of, of billionaires in America. I, I can't say I find them very inspirational. I mean, but there's some who are trying to set examples. I mean, like Bill Gates is, is one fantastic example of an individual who has enormous amounts of wealth, but has made a decision that he's going to focus on funding the complex problems of the world. He's not just focused on making the next billion. So, you know, I think, and, and, and the Gates mindset is catching on with others. People have issues about him. There's lots of conspiracy theories, but show me somebody who has, accumulated that level of wealth that Gates has and is really focusing on solving complex problems in the world and measuring that impact. There are yeah. not that many individuals. Yeah. Idris, how, uh, is Idris still around? Yeah. Ah, yeah. 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 Um, how can we convince the masses of, of these causes uh, uh, going on, um, yeah. On, on, on the topic we just discussed. I mean, how can we convert the masses um, uh, of, the, of the virtues of the upside of inclusion? You mean the average people with yeah, masses? Yeah, average people, because average people, of course, they, as we just discussed, um, I, I don't think they're so convinced of uh, how things are interconnected, how all these issues are uh, tied to each other. Uh, so how are we going to convince them, except from what Canini said about presenting facts? <laughs> I think this is a very big, big uh, question, of course. That's why I'm asking you that question. Of course. <laughs> my, my thoughts are, uh, maybe, maybe let me put also something important, that uh, inclusion is also about gender, but it's not only about gender. Inclusion is that, what I, want, what I tried to say before, that a lot of people feel excluded. So the, the masses, when, if you would call it, and it, it depends if you talk about Northern Europe or you talk about an African country, whatever, people feel somewhere that the system neglects them. And there are a few that are within the system, within the bubble, flourishing. So, um, to convince uh, the masses that uh, uh, this is something important, I think is first of all also listening to them. Listening what is coming uh, from, let's say also just average people, because uh, inclusion is also that in our society, in the Netherlands, when you are above 60 and you try to find a job, that's an issue. If you are, um, if your body is not working like it should, like the normal body does, it's very difficult to also to find a job. There are a, lo a lot of layers in society where people feel neglected. So if you want to 
connect the masses to this phenomenon, inclusion, is also to listen to them and to acknowledge that you have uh, uh, um, uh, a lot of parts that maybe are not uh, um, really connected to uh, uh, to, to the de developments like they would that, that, that they would want to. So um, again, it's uh, inclusion. It's it has so many different layers. You cannot uh, uh, draw a picture that the whole masses would say. Oh yeah, let's let's live in an inclusive world. But to listen to all the different voices belonging to those people raising the concern, I'm not heard. To listen to them and also to give them a voice and then act accordingly. And then it's of course much bigger than being an investor. It could be a local community. It could be again uh, the education system. But this is but then again the, the biggest group. Them. If I'm if I'm talking about Holland, the biggest group that claims to be unheard wants the exact opposite of what you and me and everybody here wants. So how do you solve that problem? Who is that, and what do they want? Well, <laughs> good, question. Uh, good question. I think you need to educate them also. Educate. It's up to me. Find, find, you are part of the media. Yeah, so yeah. I'm I'm trying, I but I'm I'm, I'm I'm not the best teacher probably. Yeah. In that. Yeah. Yes, and show good examples of how it works. Yeah, yeah. But, but Sandra, just can I just say one quick point? I, 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 maybe it's an English language thing. Yeah. Um, English is my mother tongue. But let's be careful about the language that we use when we say things like the masses and the average person. It, it really creates a them and us sort of scenario. Yeah. So I prefer to use the term the majority. Um, because again, you know, if you asked me, what's the sign that people are disenfranchised? Brexit and the Trump presidency. Those are two clear symptoms yeah. of the fact that there's huge levels of um, a lack of, you know, feeling like you're, you're, you're heard and you're being listened to. So, so I just wanted to highlight that term, that it can be quite divisive if we're not careful. Yeah, no, of course, of course. Uh, yeah, good point. Um, uh, Marianne, last question for, uh, for you. Uh, you. You started this conversation by saying that you uh, see um, female entrepreneurs suffering more from COVID uh, than male entrepreneurs because they have simply less uh, money on the bank. Does that also mean that you are more active than ever uh, in, in raising more money uh, for those female entrepreneurs? Extremely active. We even created another program for female entrepreneurs called FempreneurHope.nl, where we help women that are affected by the crisis to raise funds. So not yeah. just raising funds to scale their company, but really helping them survive during these times. And what we see is that it really helps by giving them free consultations, that they're able to raise funds even in this difficult time yeah. just to survive are you are you still positive i'm always positive <laughs> <laughs> and 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 maybe it's a good time uh, for any entrepreneurs also female entrepreneurs to start i mean uh, a crisis is always a good time to start right i think so because if you have a company you want to solve a problem if you start with a business you want to solve a problem so that is what i tell uh, female entrepreneurs the ones that i focus on to do yeah that if you are, we, we, I'm talking to a lot of students of, of the technical universities, but also the economic uh, department. And all of them said, I want to start a business, but I don't know how. I said, do you see a problem? Do you want to solve it? Then you, do you think you can make money out of it? Then you can start a business. Yeah. Great. Um, thank you, Kanini and Idris, for joining us. Uh, uh, thank you, Marianne, for joining You're me. Welcome. Uh, and thank to all. Uh, thank you, all viewers, for watching this.